Welcome to Speakernomics, the official podcast of the National Speakers Association, brought to you by Leadership Books. I'm Kenneth Kitty, but friends call me Shark. And like you, I'm a professional speaker, and I love listening to Speakernomics. It's the professional speaker show that will help you thrive to grow a speaking business so you too can change the world, one keynote, session, workshop, and speech at a time. And on this episode, we're going to speak with Grant Baldwin. He is the founder and CEO of the Speaker Lab, having helped thousands of people build successful and sustainable speaking businesses. He's a speaker, podcaster, author, and accomplished entrepreneur. Grant, welcome to Speakernomics. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Doing quite well, Shark. Thanks for letting me hang out with you, man. Absolutely. Now, to all my speaking friends, I want to ask you, what are you doing to build your speaking business and make it sustainable? What systems do you have in place? What processes to not only get paid to speak once, but build a business to sustain many gigs over a career? And before we jump in, make sure to go to speakernomics.com. That's where you can find the tips, insights, and knowledge to help you become a better speaker, build a better business, and get paid to speak. Grant, let's dive in. So I remember a story I had with a friend of mine a year or so ago who was new to speaking and he wanted some coaching and I was trying to point him in a few different directions. And I remember having this conversation and I brought up you, I brought up some legendary people like Lois Kramer and some other coaches. I started thinking a little bit about performance on stage with a little bit of like what Michael Port and Heroic does mm -hmm. as well. We were talking about the outreach component. And obviously, I bragged on some of the teachings that you do from the reaching out, but kind of, if you will, differentiate yourself from other coaches and consultants and, and those kind of folks in this space to talk about what the Speaker Lab does. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, well, one thing I would say is like the the Lois's, the Michael Ports, uh, Heroic, you know, a, a lot of people in this space, like all of them are phenomenal, phenomenal yeah, people. So yeah. friends with all of them. That's great a good people. crowd to be in, if you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's humbling just to be mentioned in, in, you know, in the same sentence as any of them. So I don't know that, that necessarily like the speaker lab is anything like, Hey, special, unique versus anybody else in the, in the industry. So I'm not, um, uh, naive enough to think that, you know, there's some special sauce that we teach that nobody else does. Um, but what I will say is like, I, I know that we've been at this for a long time. We've helped a lot of speakers. We've got a lot of good systems processes, uh, results that, that, prove just kind of the, the track record of, of speakers can do this. You know, I think the, the big thing that a lot of speakers come in looking for is they're going like, I think I can do this. I have the potential, but I just need the plan. For, for me personally, that's kind of where I was at years ago. This is close to 20 years ago. Uh, I had been a youth pastor, went to Bible college, had done a little bit of speaking. I was interested in doing more. You know, I'd kind of vaguely heard like this might be a career or profession, um, but just didn't really know like, yeah, but how do you actually book a gig? And what do you speak about? And who hires speakers? And like, how does this work? And I Again, I felt like I had the potential, but I needed the plan, had the potential, but I needed the plan. I felt like I could do this. I just need someone to show me like, what are the steps that you need to take? And a lot of times on, you know, kind of the outside looking in people naively think that in order to be a successful speaker, you have to have, uh, you have to have some crazy overcoming obstacle story. You need to, uh, have climbed Mount Everest. You need to have cured cancer. You need to have won a Nobel peace prize. You need to have do, done something that people are like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That checks out. Therefore they should be a speaker. And I personally, like a lot of people didn't feel like. I had that. Like I'm a white male from the Midwest. I grew up in a pretty normal middle-class family. I've never broken a bone. I, like there's nothing on paper that you, you would think that, okay, therefore that guy should be a speaker. Like I remember early on, I met a, a guy who's a phenomenal speaker, a good friend, uh, Josh Sunquist. And uh, Josh had cancer as a child. He had a leg amputated. He went on to become a one-legged downhill skier in the Paralympics. And I remember hearing that and I'm just like, I can't compete with that. Like what am, what am I supposed to do? This is not fair. And I, I, I remember thinking kind of that, but then quickly realizing that ultimately being successful as a speaker comes down to being really good at solving one specific problem for one specific audience. And then once you're clear on that, rather than just saying like, hey, I have this cool story and I just want to help people and I just kind of go out there and I speak about anything and everything, like that doesn't work. And the most successful speakers in the industry understand that, that they solve, again, one specific problem for one specific audience. But from there, it's so much more than just saying like, okay, I know who I speak to and I know what problem I solve. Now I just sit back and I wait for the phone to ring. Like you got to be disciplined to be much more proactive than reactive rather than just waiting on a bureau or an agency or someone to magically find you. And I just post some stuff on social and I hope it all just magically works out of saying, no, no, I'm going to be proactive and actively reaching out and knocking on doors and uh, making phone calls and following up and doing like the hard work necessary 
to be successful as a speaker. And so that's like the behind the scenes dirty work that most people just don't want to do and ultimately don't do and wonder why they don't have the results of those that are much more successful. What are the types of processes that you find new speakers need to have? And also the ones that we often find with even mid-level speakers who get a little lazy and forget to do certain things when business gets tough. We all had to do some reinvention, if you will. Everybody had to start over a little bit of that outreach after COVID. Yep. 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 So inside the speaker lab, one of the things we do is we teach what we call the speaker success roadmap. It it spells the acronym speak S P E A K. And so uh, we've touched on several parts of that. Let me give you kind of a high level view and then we'll kind of dig in specifically on the outreach part. So the S is for selecting a problem to solve, selecting a problem to solve. So like we touched on, you got to be really, really clear on who you speak to, what problem you solve. The mistake a lot of speakers make here is again, we, we feel the need to go big, broad, vague, wide. And so who do I speak to? I speak to people. I speak to humans. My message is for everybody. And what do I speak about? You know, I don't know. What do you want me to speak about? I can speak about anything. I can speak about sales or leadership or marketing or customer service or motivation or change or on and on the list goes. And we become this like we become this buffet rather than being a steakhouse. And so we tell speakers all the time, be the steakhouse, not the buffet. Be the steakhouse, not the buffet. Meaning, Shark, if you and I are going out for a steak and we're looking for something good to eat, we have a choice. We could go to a buffet where steak is one of a hundred things that they offer and they're all mediocre, or we could go to a steakhouse where they do one thing, but they do that one thing really well. They don't do tacos. They don't do lasagna. They don't do cupcakes. They don't do sushi. They do steak. And that is it. And so the mistake again, for so many speakers is like, we want to be the buffet, but I could also do this. And I can also do that. And I could also speak on this. And we, again, try to spread this net as far and wide as possible. And it becomes very, very ineffective and inefficient. So the most important part of outreach is actually being clear on who you are reaching out to, because if you're going like, I speak about anything and everything, then like, I don't know who I, I need to talk to about that. But when you say, no, no, I solve one specific problem for one specific audience. Now it narrows down very specifically of, okay, now I know exactly exactly what it is that I'm looking for. So that's the first part, selecting a problem to solve. The P is to prepare your talk. Be really, really clear about what's the solution that you're providing and how you're going to be providing that solution. The E is to establish yourself as the expert. So two key marketing assets that you need is you need a website, you need a demo video. If you don't have a website in this day and age, people won't take you seriously. And a demo video is kind of like a like a movie trailer. Like it's a, it's a risk mitigation tool for event planners and decision makers. Whenever they're hiring you, they're taking a massive risk of putting you up on stage, giving you a microphone, letting you talk to their people. So that demo video helps to kind of reduce some of that risk and help them feel like, all right, this person would be a good fit. They're not going to say anything stupid or embarrassing, or that's going to get us all canceled. Uh, and so that, that demo video is very, very important. Then we get to the A of acquiring paid speaking gigs. And this is the part we're kind of touching on here, Shark, where we need to be much more, again, proactive rather than reactive. Rather than saying, I got my website, I got my video, and now I sit back and I wait for the phone to ring, that doesn't work. Like speaking is very much a momentum business. I've, I've heard multiple people say, the more you speak, the more you speak. And But when you're trying to get going, when you're trying to go from zero to one, it feels like you're pushing that boulder uphill. Now, over time, what should happen is your speaking business should be a self-perpetuating flywheel, meaning each time you speak, assuming you're doing a great job, then it should be spinning off additional business. Now, that doesn't mean that like every gig I do, that right then and there at that very moment that I'm booking a whole bunch of other gigs, but it should be starting conversations. If, if every time you're speaking, you know, you get people who are always like nice and, oh, that was awesome. That was a great talk and polite to your face, but you're not actually getting additional business that becomes a red flag for you. Like, and oftentimes you just need to improve the product of what it is that you are doing as a speaker. But especially when you're getting going there, so much of what you need to be doing is proactive outreach, identifying specific events, specific conferences, specific associations that are hiring speakers. And this is easy to do online. This is easy to browse around. This is also easy to do within your own network of talking with people who are in that space, who, uh, who may be looking for speakers. Now, oftentimes, times. There may be people that you're like, well, I don't, you know, I don't know anybody. I'm not related to anyone. I don't have any friends or connections who actually hire speakers. Maybe not, but you probably know someone who knows someone who does. So for example, you know, if, if you're going to a, a, a chiropractor, you know, your chiropractor uh, may not be the one that's hiring speakers, but they're probably a part of an association that is, and may know of who you need to talk to or what events that they go to or continuing education things that they're a part of that you could start some type of conversation there. But at that point, from just reaching out at so much more than just like 
sending an email or making a phone call and saying, hey, if you ever need a speaker, I hope you think of me. Like that's not going to go anywhere. Like again, asking specific questions that make it easy to respond to. So what I would do is uh, I would find some type of specific event. And here's this, you know, fall sales conference that's happening uh, several months from now. I'd identify who the, um, uh, the event planner, the decision maker is, and I'd reach out. And again, rather than just some vague thing of, hey, if you ever need a speaker, you know, let me know. But saying, hey, I noticed that you have this event in San Antonio in November. You know, I was curious when you'll start reviewing speakers for that. Something that's easy for them to respond to. And from there, they say, oh, we already hired a speaker or we'll start reviewing in June or actually we're starting the process now or our board or committee or whoever is meeting in the next few weeks. Awesome. Now you have something to go off of. And rather than um, just, again, kind of leaving it open and vague, like, hey, you know, well, again, when you start reviewing speakers, I hope you could throw my name in the hat and think of me like, no, no, just say, hey, you know, uh, whenever you are meeting, uh, I would love to be a part of that conversation. Uh, would it be OK if I followed up with you afterwards or before just to touch base to see if there's any other information that you need for me to be considered for this? Uh, and I think I, I found personally uh, that so much of success as a speaker is not only reaching out, but like following up. Because we all understand in order to be successful as a speaker is it's so much more than what you do on stage. Yes, you absolutely like the table stakes are you need to be amazing on stage. But part of what they're hiring you to do is to be great to work with off stage, meaning that uh, being an event planner means you are juggling thousands of balls at a time. You're spinning thousands of plates and a speaker is just one part of that. And so the easier you are to work with, the more likely they're gonna wanna be to not only work with you, to refer you, to recommend you to other people. And so whenever you say, hey, your committee is meeting in three weeks, is it okay if I follow up with you? Of course, they're gonna say sure, because they don't think you're gonna actually do it. But when you do, you're giving them this, this precursor, this look into, no, this is what it's like to work with me because I do what I say I'm going to do. When I say I'm going to follow up, I'm going to follow up and I'm going to make your life easy, Mr. or Mrs. Event Planner, so that whenever it comes time for the event, that again, your job is simple and the speaker is the least of your concerns. So I think a big part of it is, again, being proactive, reaching out, and then following up, doing what you say you're going to do. I do a ton of this kind of consulting too in, in with businesses, and I'm, I'm often amazed when some of the mindset happens where they don't believe they need to be proactive and outreach. Yeah. They could just go post some things. It drives me crazy, but I, I absolutely love what you said about the follow-up because I've been guilty of this before. And I remember somebody that said this to me extremely well, Meredith Elliott Powell and I were just having a casual conversation one day. And she said something like when she gets a lead, she's like a barnacle on a boat. She makes yeah. sure she follows up and very few people. I know I did this because I put on my own event. I had people reach out to me, never follow up, never follow mm -hmm. up. I'd even respond to some of them. And they were juggling so many things because they didn't have a system or a process in place. And and I love that. So, but again, like things... we, we, we can all understand this, like outside of the speaking world, like think about it in yeah. your own life. Like, let me give an example. We just, um, uh, about a year ago or so we had a, like a really hard freeze here in Nashville and it killed off a bunch of our landscaping. And so we needed to have some landscaping work done. And my wife and I spent about a month reaching out to various landscapers in the area. And it was sh just shocking, like how few people would follow up, would call back, would return calls, would return. Like I'm calling saying, I am trying to give you money right now. Mm -hmm. And so many people are just like, they're just not answering. They're not following up. People are like, oh, we'll get back to you. Oh, we'll show up at this day. And then Denver show up. Oh, we're going to be two hours late. Uh, people would come and like, all right, you know, we look everything over. We're going to give you, you know, we'll email you a quote tomorrow and you'd never hear from them. And it's just like, it just blew my mind. And so the company that we ended up hiring was uh, actually one of the more expensive companies that we talked to, but they just, they said they were going to show up on time and they showed up on time. They said, Hey, we're going to get this. I'm going to show up on this day and uh, I'm going to bring a crew of this many people and we're going to have the work done in this many days. And they did it. And we've gone back to them for another project just <laughs> recently because like the first time around, they were just yeah. great to work with. Like I didn't even bother pricing other people because I knew this guy would show up when he said he was going to show up and he was going to do what he said he was going to do. And, and Shark, to your point, like so many speakers, just drop the ball on that. And so it's like, it's, it's mind blowing that, you know, in the service industry, just in general, but certainly for speakers, that the bar is actually low. Just do what you say you're going to do, follow up with people, stay on, stay top of mind. And you could be really, really successful doing that versus like feeling like, 
uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I think I'm a big enough name that I shouldn't have to chase people. I shouldn't have to follow people. Like get over yourself. Like the reason you're not getting booked is because you're lazy and you probably are not that great of a speaker, despite what you may think. So the best speakers are oftentimes like not even the, the or excuse me, the most booked speakers are oftentimes maybe not even the best speakers on the planet, but they spend the time behind the scenes to chase, to follow up, to do the hard work that most speakers aren't willing to do. And therefore they're getting on stage way more than others. Others. Well, I'm a big proponent of CRMs to help people if they do, but I can't tell you the number of times people have implemented a CRM and then they don't use it for simple yeah. things like follow-up. And that's why I loved a conversation at a few weeks ago with Ross Bernstein, who's doing a gazillion gigs a year. He doesn't even have a CRM. He just makes certain that he follows up on every one of them. And it's little things like that, that you can easily see where it works in the business world. And you should be thinking about that as well in your own life. But I'll also add one thing to, you, to what you said about associations, because a big chunk of my own career was also speaking in corporate. So I'm going to make up a couple of companies these is an example, but if I'm speaking at company A in front of a thousand people, nobody from there in that audience is uh, working at company B also, mm -hmm. but you can leverage that the same way. You're not going to necessarily get a referral out of it, but you can leverage that to bridge conversations over just as, just as much as if you were doing an association gig and had people there. So there's so many different ways, but it, again, it goes back to the point about follow-up. And I think that was a a great point. So yeah, one of the let things, me piggyback on a couple yeah, things if I could real quick there. So course. one would be like on the CRM thing is like, yeah, have a CRM, but like have some type of system, you know? So there's a variety of different CRMs out there. There's not one that's like special more so than, than another one, but you got to have a system that works and that you use, but also just recognize that like subscribing to a CRM, buying a CRM on its own does nothing for you. It's like saying, I want to lose weight. Therefore I got a gym membership, but I don't actually go to the gym. Like getting a gym membership doesn't help you get in shape at all. Like you got to still go to the gym, do the thing, put in the work, lift the heavy things. The same thing is true with a CRM. So if you're going to, whatever CRM you use, it's going to be helpful. And, and like, I would recommend that you use something and have some type of system versus like saying, oh yeah, I'll remember to follow up with you in July. No, you're not. Um, because realistically you need to have dozens and dozens of active leads in the pipeline that you're following up on people that you talk to, you know, um, this year or this week, and they say, Hey, we already booked our speaker. Great. Do you mind if I follow up with you a year from now or 10 months from now, when you start reviewing speakers for the following year, because again, you're not going to remember that, but whenever a year from now comes up and they pop up in your CRM or whatever task management system you have, you're like, Oh dang, I'm glad I planted that seed a year ago. And I followed up with them. So one have some type of system, whatever the system is, but the system alone doesn't do anything. You got to actually utilize the system Two, I was going to say, kind of piggyback on, on your second point there of using some of those, not necessarily even referrals, but just kind of the um, credibility pieces of, you know, especially if you're speaking at a, let's say a state association or a state group, there's 49 other of those around the country. And so if you say, Hey, I just spoke at XYZ association in Nebraska, then the, the company that you're reaching out to or the association you're reaching out to in Kentucky or Florida or New Mexico or wherever is going, okay, well, if Nebraska hired you uh, and it sounds like you did a good job, or I can reach out to that, that event planner that I know up there, then you probably would do a good job for our audience as well. So leverage each event that you do, because again, like we talked about earlier, just like a demo video is a risk mitigation tool, you know, saying that you spoke at XYZ conference in the same space and in the same pond gives other event planners confidence like okay if you're good enough for them you're probably going to be good enough for us ran i don't appreciate the gym reference that's just a knock on me spending too much time <laughs> at the buffet because i've gained too much weight but uh, just kidding uh, one of the things i wanted to talk about though as well was we see so many speakers i'm sure you see them come into your your business so we all want to see the next generation of speakers come in but be sustainably successful not just get a gig mm -hmm. you know i i think about this reference especially with so many people that try to get not get rich quick, but it's almost kind of like the social media become trendy quickly. And they think they're going to do that with a speaking business, which for most people who were successful at it, no, it's a slog. It takes a lot of building. Yep. I mean, speaker, the speaker lab wasn't built overnight. It, sure. you know, to build any kind of business, generally it takes a little bit of time, but so many of the people I'm going to go back to an old reference uh, that will show my age was Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic park. Brilliantly said your scientists were so preoccupied with, uh, whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And I think that yeah. sometimes apropos for young speakers as well, or people that jump into the speaking business, how do you go about helping keep these people 
in a sustainable business so they can build a sustainable business rather instead of just chasing after a few gigs. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right that the, the speaking is a very aspirational career. It's a dream thing for most people of, you know, we're all lunatics to think that we should stand on stage, run our mouths. People should listen and clap and stand up for us. And someday when I grow up, I'm going to learn this. Yeah. And like, uh, and people pay us stupid amounts of money for it. It's like, it's a, it's a crazy industry just in general. Right. So let's just set that, get that aside. So that means that a lot of people are like, well, I can do that. I should stand up there. People should pay me money to speak. Right. So it is this dream type of thing for so many people. But also I think a, a couple of things you got to do is one, you have to treat this like a business, like the difference between speakers who are successful and those that are not, are those that treat it like a business versus those that treat it like a hobby. If you're just going like, I speak every so often and I'm surprised I'm not booked more and my fees aren't as high as theirs and why not? It's like, it's probably because you guys are taking two different efforts, amounts of effort and energy that you're putting into the thing, into the craft, into your business. And so one is treating it like a business. We've seen so many students who've been successful because they come in and they have the mentality of a business owner and an entrepreneur versus like, I'm a speaker, I'm a big deal. People should just book me just because I breathe. Like that's ridiculous. Like again, kind of get over yourself. And the second thing I would say is have a long-term perspective for this. You're not going to all of a sudden become this amazing speaker overnight. And occasionally, very, very rarely, we hear these stories of, you know, such and such did this one TEDx talk and then they blew up and like, that could be me. It's like, man, that's probably not, you know, there's not some speaker American idol where you're going to get discovered and all of a sudden you're going to blow up. Like the reality is, is like, you got to have this long-term perspective of you just put in the work, you put in the reps. And that means you're going to do some random gigs of, I spoke in some, you know, random cafeteria. And then I spoke in some uh, jail. And then I spoke in some random thing and they paid me $10 in a subway gift card. And like all of a sudden, like it all started to build some momentum over time. And five years later, I'm doing 60 gigs at 10,000 a pop, right? That doesn't just happen though, but having the long-term perspective, treating it like a business, like those are the things that can start to build some momentum for you. You've connected with a ton of schools. You speak, you've been a youth pastor. You've, you've seen this next generation of people coming up. What do you think it will take to help build more professional speakers, successful ones that are younger, that in that audience that, you know, every business, NSA, all of them want to attract new speakers down the road that are younger, bring new energy, new ideas, new thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I, again, I can speak to like, that was, uh, that was me. I, I was, uh, in my early twenties, uh, whenever I got into the speaking, when I attended my first influence was, um, uh, I believe it was in Al Albuquerque, you know, back in like the mid early two thousands, uh, oh, wow. and feeling like, I remember I was one of the youngest people there and going like, what, what am I doing here? Uh, and several times I was speaking at different events where I was the youngest person in the room. Um, but again, I, I would go back to, you know, one of the things we just touched on that there are absolutely speakers who are going like, I just love speaking. And rather than saying, therefore, I should be a successful speaker, realizing like, no, no, it doesn't work like that. You know, again, you, you got to be willing to put in the work, to treat it like a business, to have a long-term perspective. And those, again, those speakers that are killing it, who are in their twenties, thirties, whatever it may be, again, are the ones that are just doing the work, you know? So uh, I'll give you another example. I really enjoy playing pickleball. Shark, you ever played pickleball before? No, I played tennis forever, but I, okay, I, all right. I'm you afraid need, you to need try to get, pickle, pickleball. Nah, get, get in on pickleball. All right. So <laughs> uh, I enjoy playing pickleball, I play a couple days a week with a couple of buddies. And there are, there are guys who just take it way more seriously than I do. And they are all in on it. They are watching YouTube videos. They're taking lessons. I mean, they are obsessed with pickleball. They're analyzing their paddle, yada, yada, yada. And I just don't. I just enjoy the fun of it. I enjoy the, the competitiveness of it. But therefore, whenever I show up to play and I notice like, wow, these other guys just keep getting better and I am not like I shouldn't be getting frustrated or disappointed. Like, wait a second, that's not fair. Why are they better than me? Because they are putting more energy and effort into it. So it, it shouldn't be shocking that they're just a better at the at the craft or at the thing than I am. So, again, realize like. The, the results that you have in your business are absolutely like based on the effort and the energy that you have put into. Like, again, whatever speaker you look up to, you admire, you respect, I promise you that they are doing their best behind the scenes to build it. And it wasn't like they just woke up and blinked a couple of times and all of a sudden they have the successful business that they, that they do. It doesn't matter what they post on social or the pictures or anything like that. They've put in the work to build their business and to sustain their business. Any speaker can do a handful of gigs, maybe some even high profile gigs, but to do that year after year after year, again, you, you gotta put in the reps and you gotta have a long-term perspective to it. 
Did you know that the demand for women speakers in keynote positions is exceptionally high right now? Hi friends, Brittany Richmond here with the Speaker Lab and I'm one of the full-time speakers here on our team and I have conversations exactly like this with decision makers and event planners all the time. They want more women in keynote positions and here at the Speaker Lab, we want to show you exactly how to do that more consistently, making an income and an impact with your message. Book a call with our team today to find out how at thespeakerlab.com backslash NSA. Go be great, friends. Who are the people that kind of inspired you to become a speaker? Uh, one was my youth pastor. Um, you know, when I was in high school, my youth pastor had a really big impact on my life. He was a, a phenomenal speaker, but um, also just had a, a big impact in my world. And so I kind of felt like, man, if I can make the kind of impact in others' lives that he made in my life, that seems really fulfilling and rewarding. And so that was, again, that's kind of the path I was on. I went to Bible college and then was a, a youth pastor for a couple of years. And that just gave me a lot of opportunities to speak. And speaking was one of those things I, I like a lot of people, like I enjoyed, felt like I was decent at, wanted to do more of, just wondering like, yeah, but how does it work? And speaking, you know, like we've talked about is this for so many people is this mysterious black box. Uh, and so he had a huge impact on me for sure. Um, even in college, there was a guy that I, I worked for um, who was a, a professional speaker in like the church uh, market. And so um, got to help him a little bit behind the scenes and uh, just kind of like, again, seeing that, oh, this is, is a career, like this is a thing. And so I, guess, I think for most people, we just didn't realize like th this was not on the menu of job opportunities or career paths we could choose in, in school. And, you know, we saw a speaker or met a speaker and like, wait a second, you could do this? Like you can make a living? Like this is a thing? The NSA is what? Like, the so uh, I think for for so many of us, like there was some speaker that we saw or that um, that that we felt like, oh, well, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. Not in a, not in a negative way of like, well, all right, if this joker can get paid, I can surely get paid. But more just like, man, that, like they changed my world from speaking. And if I could do that for others, like, how do I do that? Like, that seems really, really cool. Well, and seeing some of the amazing speakers that somewhere like influenced must have really helped propel your career as well. So let's do a recap based on some of Grant's great advice. One, again, I love this reminder. Don't be the buffet, be the steakhouse. Like mm -hmm. if they serve fried chicken, if they serve steak, if they serve crab legs and jello run, to identify yourself as the steakhouse. Number two, you got to be proactive, not reactive. You've got to help build momentum, not just wait for it to happen. And number three, is your speaking business a hobby or is it a business? Treat it like a business. Grant works with a ton of students who understand this. You've got to build a long-term perspective on the business. Love the craft, build a business. You want to build and sustain it, obsess on it and be great on stage. All right, Grant, any closing thoughts before we get out of here and speak ourselves back on stage? Yeah, sure. We've covered a lot of ground today. I, I mean, I think that uh, the big thing, again, like we've touched on multiple times here is having a long-term perspective, doing the work, treating it like a business, not a hobby. Um, I, I think, re honestly, man, it is just like, it's just doing the work. It's no different than anything else. And and man, I, as much as we wish and, and uh, we, we desire for it just to be easy, it is simple, but it's not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. You know, let's go back to the the health example. You know, if you want to lose 10 pounds, you know, what do you need to do? Well, I, I mean, I'm no health expert, but you need to pay attention to what you eat and you need to exercise. You need to lift some heavy things. You need to go for a walk. You know, it's like, again, it's simple. Oh, okay. Just, you know, eat, eat good and exercise. Great. I can do that. It's simple, but it's not easy. It still requires work, still requires commitment, still requires discipline. And so everything we've talked about in terms of building a successful career as a speaker, you can absolutely do, but you got to do the work, you know, listening to this on its own, coming to influence, getting a CRM, talking with other speakers, joining your local chapter. All of those things are great. By all means, take it, take action on all those things. But that alone doesn't magically build a speaking business for you. Again, you got to be the one to do the work. Don't look for an agency. Don't look for a bureau. Don't look for someone else to magically solve the problem for you. You got to get in the trenches and do the work for yourself. And it's funny because so many people isolate the phone as this 800 pound gorilla or their sure. mouse and they don't want to send emails. But when you remove that from the equation and think about it from an outreach perspective and ask people, do you do outreach? Oh yeah, I do outreach. I mean, that's all it is. I mean, it's just connecting with people. Friends, make sure to join us at speakernomics.com and let your voice be heard. Thank you to Leadership Books for sponsoring this episode. I am Kenneth Kinney, your host of the National Speakers Association's podcast, Speakernomics. And this has been another great episode of the show. To everyone listening, thank you for the privilege of your time. And remember, Speakernomics is a podcast where you'll learn to speak, get paid, repeat. Yeah.